So friends, this is part two with Ronnie McDowell, and he is going to tell us the story about how the King is Gone went down and all the amazing things that happened around it. Check this out. So you're telling the story, and I'm sorry I interrupted you, but you were telling me the story about The King is Gone. Yeah. This was an iconic song after Elvis passed away. Very iconic. Um, in fact, I cried <laughs> when I heard it, and I bet a lot of other people did I cried too. too when I was I heard 12, it. 13 years old, you know. I was when, broken hearted. When I heard it on the radio, I know it's crazy, but I cried too. Yeah. That's God's truth. And I, I sang it, and I wrote it, and it still made me cry. But anyway, we so... We were talking about Gail Pollock, which Scotty called her his personal assistant. It was really his girlfriend. Uh, big time. Right. So... <laughs> and uh, so... I had no earthly idea when I recorded The King's Gone that at uh, Studio 19 Music City Recorders that Scotty Moore owned the studio. Now that's a twist of irony, is it not? Indeed it is. And so the next morning I flew down to Nashville, didn't sleep at all, because I wrote hot checks to pay for the studio, the tape, everything. It was $2,800. I had $40 to my name. And Lee Morgan, who helped me write the song, he walked out and said, you're going to have to pay for this. He just walked out. I had to, I wrote hot checks for the musicians, for the tape, for the studio. You know how much money that was? I mean, my That's heart... That's go-to-jail money. My heart froze. Time. So I slept with that tape, and I flew down to Monument Studios, which is still there, in the little triangle, where Scotty had his tape business. And I was sitting on the steps, those iron steps. I went by there last weekend. They're still there. And, and here come Gail. Unbeknownst to me, I didn't know Gail was Scotty's girlfriend, and I'd been knowing her for years. And she never told me that. And so she said, Ronnie, what are you doing here? And I said, Gail, I want eight acetates made of this song. She said, what you got? And I said, I think I got a hit. And so she made me eight acetates. I wrote hot checks for those two. <laughs> and I went out to Weno Radio, little AM station in Madison. Why well, I went there. Now, another twist of irony, half a mile from Colonel Tom Parker's house. So I walked in, and I said, would you play this? And this girl goes, well, we just don't do that off the street. And I said, well, it's about Elvis. Elvis' emotion was so high, she took it back to the DJ, and there was a glass wall. I could tell he put that needle down on that turntable with that acetate, and he went like this, come here. And I went there, and he said, you stand right here. I'm going to play this see if you get any reaction. And I was like, wow, thank you. It hadn't got a fourth into it, and all of his phone lines lit up. And he goes, something's wrong with my phone. And he goes, okay, okay. And he goes, man, this song ain't even over, and they want to hear it again. And he never, he had to play it till I left there three hours later. Channel 5 come out, put me on the 5 o'clock news. It exploded. It was un It was like a movie. And then I went to the big rock station here in town. When I left there, I told them that story. And there was three guys in the hallway, and he looked at the acetate. He went inside this little sound room. I could tell he was going to listen to it. And he did the same thing. He said, come here. He said, we're going to play this. Number one rock station. And he came back out three minutes later, and he goes, you have jogged our phone lines jammed them totally. He said, you've got to smash. And that was it. Sold a million records in a week. Two weeks later, I was on American Bandstand, and Dick Clark and I became friends until he passed away. Incredible story. I got goosebumps to that. Did you feel that? <laughs> I've heard them before. <laughs> wow. I'm thankful and honored to, you know. That's, it's amazing. To hear them. Amazing. But, the, but now, I didn't tell... I didn't tell you. Now, all I know you is by the spa guy. That's all right. I'm Billy the spa guy. Billy Stallings Billy. is my name. Well, Billy, <laughs> let me tell you this. Now, that was Friday, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Saturday, the record had exploded here in town, so they wanted me on the Grand Ole Opry. I didn't know this song. We, I threw it together. So I go out there, and I'm standing, and the Opry was, they were hanging from the rafters. I was standing against the wall, tapping my foot, and I'm going, Lord, please let me remember this song. I didn't even know it. And Jim Ed Brown walked up to me, who, ironically, used to be on the road with Elvis in 54, him and his sisters. Mm -hmm. Elvis was in love with the youngest Brown sister. 
And then she one called, of the Brown sisters just passed recently. Yes, yes. Uh, Maxine's, Maxine's still living. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so Jim Ed put his arm around me and he said, son, you're going to do fine. I said, Mr. Brown, I'm not afraid to sing. I just don't know this song. I just wrote it. He goes, when did you write it? And I said, two days ago. And he goes, two days ago? He said, well, good luck, son. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to know, I went out there and I never missed a note. Not awesome. one syllable. But that wasn't the scariest part. Two weeks later, I'm on American Bandstand. Still didn't know this song that well. And Dick Clark come in the dressing room. And he, I said, Mr. Clark, I'm so glad y'all pantomime, because I've been watching you since 57. He said, Ronnie, we don't do that anymore. You got to sing it live in front of 80 million people. I said, please don't tell me that. He said, you'll have cue cards underneath the camera. But if you look at me on American Bandstand doing that song, I looked like I was in total control, like I knew what I was doing, but inside I was petrified, but I made it. That's amazing. Incredible story. I remember that song coming out and it just being uh, uh, unbelievable. Well, let me tell you the best part about that song, the best thing that happened. My mother had 11 of us, right? She worked three jobs trying to take... And so Ronnie, uh, Friends, unfortunately, my battery died, <laughs> so I didn't get the end of the story. So, uh, tell us about the impact that The King Is Gone had on your mother. That Friday afternoon that the record broke, the one thing that I wanted to do was go tell my mother. And she had 11 of us, and she worked three jobs as long as I ever knew her. I don't know how she lived to be 66. But anyway, so... I went up to Pure Truck Stop along the Kentucky-Tennessee border where she was mopping the floor, God's truth. And I walked in and I said, Mother, take your apron off. You don't ever have to work again. And she goes, Son, can't you see I'm working? And this truck driver was sitting on the cap by the counter. He said, Georgia May, don't you know what's going on with that boy? And she goes, No, nah, what? And uh, I said, Mother, come out to the car. This is the truth. And I turned the radio on, and The King Is Gone was on every radio station. It, it never stopped. It, it was just like a movie. I couldn't have planned that. And my mother never worked again until she passed away, thanks to Elvis Presley. And The King Is Gone. Amazing. That's an amazing story, Ronnie. But it's the truth. Hey man, congratulations on that hit. That was, uh, well, thank that you. was, it was perfect for the time. It was very timely. And well, timing is everything. Let me tell you how fate is a hunter. I got, when Elvis passed away that Wednesday, I flew down to Memphis. I stood in line at 8.30 in the morning. This is the God's truth. And I waited. I stood in line till 5.30, from 8.30 to 5.30. I got 10 feet from the gate and they closed it. I never saw Elvis alive or lying in state. So yeah. they started rioting. The, the news media didn't show what was going on. I mean, that place was, that place was. Okay, I'm sorry, I need to be on set. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Ron. Thank you. And I'll, I'll but anyway, the reason, with you. the reason I was going to tell you about. Now, sorry, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Run this under your shirt and pull it out through this. Okay. You need to put that on there. I can do it. Bro, you got it. Did you put that mic back? Yes. Absolutely. Testing. She sent it to me this morning. Yep, that should be good. You're okay. Yeah. All right, so, you were, so we were talking about fate before you had to run on I stage. Just, my friend Steve Jeppe, I was telling you about that owns uh, Baltimore Orioles. He, he said that to me. He said, fate is a hunter. And that's just one of the greatest things I've ever heard because... When I was standing in front of the gate after standing from 8.30 to 5.30, they shut it. People started rioting. I didn't want no part of that. So I left. Halfway between Nashville and Memphis, 
I turned the radio on, they opened the gate back up, and I was devastated. It was a three and a half hour drive back to Nashville. Yes. Well, probably four back then. Right. Well, no, I yeah. was in my 77 Camaro that okay. I rode to King is Gone. <laughs> so I was flying. But anyway, so when I got back at Scorpion Records office, here's Lee Morgan. He said, let's do a tribute to Elvis. And I said, Lee, I'm not wearing no jumpsuit. And he goes, that's not what I'm talking about. Listen to this song. I listened and I said, well, listen to what I wrote, which was, I was barely six years old when I first heard him sing. So we just combined them together. Now, had I gotten in to see Elvis lying in state, you know how long that would have taken? Two or three hours because that line. Well, then Lee Morgan would not have been standing there. And so timing is everything and fate is a hunter. Love that. Fate is a hunter. Yes. Man, that's incredible. I, hey, uh, I'm going to tell you a story. In 1968, I'm a three-term combat veteran of the Vietnam War. We took a break from fighting. Me and Chuck Nietzsche and Joe Hedgepath. I'd never sang in front of anybody in my life. And just before I stepped up on the makeshift stage in Vietnam, this old man grabbed my arm and he goes, Son, right where you're going to stay, stand, Elvis Presley stood there in 1956. And I said, yeah, right. What would Elvis be doing on this old ship? He said it was docked in San Diego, and he did the Milton Berle show right where you're going to stand. And I'd never sang in front of anybody in my life. And you know what I sang? Well, the wind of my blue moon turns to gold again. So I sang an Elvis song. And... My life has just so been intertwined with Elvis, it absolutely amazes me. And then when I showed you that a while ago, my daughter called me and said, you know who Elvis's grandfather is? I said, well, yeah, I know everything. She said, no, you don't. So then when I punched in Elvis Presley's grandfather and it said Jesse D. McDowell, I was like, what the? It's and crazy. Then, and then I asked you about it. And yeah, then we start talking about it. Yeah, we did. And, and, <laughs> and I didn't uh, know she had done that. Well, I, I didn't either. Yeah. And so uh, um, my life just keeps in it. But I got to tell you this now, and then I'll uh, leave you alone. I was doing uh, the 60th anniversary of Elvis's passing with the Memphis Symphony. I was singing. On the show with me was uh, Scotty and DJ. It had been Elvis's birthday. It was his birthday, yeah. Right. You're right. And so I was doing it with the Memphis Symphony. I got out of the shower. Scotty was in the door next to me at the Ramada Inn. And in soon Memphis? As, in Memphis. Okay. So, so when I were going to be at the Pyramid? Uh, no. Uh, we were, I forget where we where we were, at the Civic Center. Yeah, it would have been uh, Cook, which yeah. was where Ellis used to be. Right. That's where we were. And so I got out of the shower and that little voice on my shoulder said, look in the sink. And I looked in the, right on the side of the sink. There was nothing else on the sink around it. And there was two hairs. Now, we know how a hair will make a question mark. But on the side of that sink was two hairs and an E-P. And I, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. And so I went over and got Scotty. And I said, Scotty, you got to come over here and look at this. And Scotty come over and he looked down at them two hairs. And he goes, good God, get a camera. <laughs> and we took a picture of it. Is that not crazy? That is crazy. That's, that's interesting. So I have all kind of stories about how my life is intertwined and, you know, with uh, Scotty and DJ and June Juanico and uh, Louise Smith is one of my best friends in the whole wide She's world. She's amazing. I, like I told you, I interviewed her just a couple of weeks ago. And man, 86, yep. she sure And one of the only girls that Elvis ever turned down. Twice. I mean, that, turned, that Elvis turned Elvis down. Elvis down. down. No, I need you to Okay, man. Thank you, Ronnie. Hey, thank you. Yes, sir. Where you get ready to go on?